Um, now, I've, I've, I've heard a rumor, and I don't know if it's true, that we may have some free software foundation people here today, um, which I think would be great because uh, um, they, they may have some questions uh, that, that we're happy to answer, and I, I think that'll even liven things up a little bit more. Um, if Richard Stallman or Eben Moglen happen to be here, I, I do want to know about it in advance because uh, I'm happy answering questions from people who are up to 10 times smarter than me, but Richard and Eben are a whole lot smarter than that. So um, I, I expect their questions will be especially challenging if they happen to be here. Um, and let me tell you why just about any question from free software people or free software enthusiasts are fair game. And, and any question is okay that you have later on. And it's because I deserve the hard questions. The reason I deserve the hard questions is because I've spent enough time over time in various fora asking exactly the same kind of questions of different kinds of speakers. Um, as an example, a, a few years ago at, at an American Bar Association convention, uh, Chris Painter from the, the Justice Department was there along with some of his colleagues. Um, telling us about how they, they're in the business of saving uh, corporate America $6 billion a year worth of losses from uh, software piracy and piracy of other kinds of media uh, here in the United States and, and overseas. And the first question that, that I presented to Mr. Painter and his colleagues is, so in giving us those numbers of, of you know how much the losses are, are you assuming that every copy made, even in uh, a poor country like China or, or over in Iran or someplace like that, that every one is a lost sale? That if they copy uh, a $600 database program, uh, that, that that's automatically a lost sale? The answer is yes. Oh, that's a realistic assumption. Um, and are you also assuming that when people copy software, there is uh, no economic benefit, no net economic or social benefit from the copy unless there's a payment made for it? Isn't the real question how we're dividing up the gains of the trade when copies are made? Well, that's not a very nice question. Um, another, another story that I'd like to relate is, in another life, I, I did actually work for the Justice Department as an assistant U.S. attorney and went down to their training center down in South Carolina for a computer crimes seminar. And there on, on a big screen, their, their version of the big screen, um, Mark Eckenweiler from the Justice Department put up a, a big image before one of his speeches showing this gigantic um, cow skull with a big cross behind it and all kinds of red colors and uh, you know, look, looked really amazing. Um, and basically that, that image and stories about 2600 and the cult of the dead cow were the, the, the booga booga that they used to, to scare all of the, 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 you know, baby AUSAs and about half the audience were people from the military, uh, about all the dangers of hack, hackerism and the, the hacker community. Um, the, the other remarkable thing about that presentation is that, that Eckenweiler basically spent a long time showing us the wonders of visual trace route and, and you know, what a remarkable tool that is. And, and most of the audience was pretty amazed that, that such a piece of software existed, uh, at which point I, I realized, you know, these government people don't really know all that much about what they're talking about. And I'll bet those CDC people are pretty damn cool. <laughs> um, during that conference, I, I it took the time to ask one of the, uh, the people from the Justice Department, so if uh, computers in the United States are attacked by uh, an enemy abroad and you hack back, now, if, and you do it without the approval of a judge, would that mean that, that whoever's doing the hack back, even if they're in the government, would be violating a criminal statute? The answer is yes. The people from the Pentagon didn't like that. They, they started shouting all kinds of things about national command authority and uh, other words that, that a civilian lawyer like me has never heard about before. Um, 
And, and I've, I've actually done the same thing on occasion, even at a panel here at H2K2. Um, I, I remember pointing out a couple years ago that um, there, there's at least a, a, a tangential correlation between uh, the costumes worn by um, hacker types in courtroom proceedings and the outcomes that they've received, and sometimes it helps to pick your battles and, and wear a tie sometimes in court if you really want to persuade the judge that your legal position is right. Uh, fight about the law, don't fight, about, don't fight with a man about who's going to wear a tie or not. Um, Needless to say, I think that was about as well received as, as the questions about um, copyright by Chris Painter. Um, now, before getting on farther with the talk, let me make a plug for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And uh, I mean, I, I think a lot of other people have, have made a, a very similar plug here, um, especially if you personally call on them uh, to provide some sort of uh, assistance or, or help make sure to make a contribution for, for what that help is, is worth in terms of their time. Um, even, if, even if you don't call on them this year for some kind of help, support anyway because sooner or later you're going to need it. And the most important thing, for God's sake, don't wait until the last minute to call them. Um, just earlier this week, I'm, I'm one of the attorneys in their network that, that receives referrals from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. and. I got a call on Wednesday from somebody saying, I've got a really bad trademark problem. My answer is, well, I'm in the middle of a deposition right now, and I, I really can't answer your question. I can't take a lot of time to do that, but I am going to be in New York, where you are, on Friday. Can we meet then? His answer is, well, on Thursday, I've got to meet with the other side. So, and you're calling me the day before? Please make sure to give the lawyer who's going to help you enough lead time to understand the case and to give you good legal representation if you do need help on anything. Um, now, moving on to the cult of the dead cow and, and what they're doing in terms of, of hacktivism and getting software out there to promote human rights. Um, another one of the interesting questions that, that I've asked on their behalf, this was shortly after they contacted me and said, well, we've got, we've got this really great piece of software. It contains uh, strong encryption and it's going to enable people in China to communicate uh, out past the firewall and this and that and the other thing. And I said, well, that, that's really terrific, but if it's strong encryption, you've got an export control problem. And I'm, I'm sure that most of the people in the audience here know how the U.S. government has used export controls as their major means of regulating uh, strong encryption technology. And so the question that I asked, and this is while the Bush administration is in charge of the Commerce Department, is, well, can the people who wrote back orifice please have permission to export strong, stronger than triple DES? I think it's an AES system. AES encryption over the internet. Um, surprisingly, the answer was yes. And that yes answer, I think, is illustrative of, um, I mean, a lot of the talks here assume that the government is sort of a monolithic entity. That's not entirely true. Um, there are a lot of good people who, when you work with them inside the government, are willing to advance your goals, or in, in my case, my clients' goals, um, even if you might think that uh, the administration proper would not share those goals at all. I mean, ex export of strong encryption by a hacker organization doesn't seem to be uh, something that the Bush administration would be interested in. Um, and, and had it gone to the level of Don Evans, uh, Don Evans is now the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, he's a gentleman who actually is in the same prayer group with George Bush. I mean, you, you know, you know the, the prayer group where they say all that stuff that, that Jesus said about blessed are the peacemakers and helping the poor people and things like that. Oh, that that's, that's all a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> but Don, Don, and, Don and George pray together a lot about, about you know, how not to help the poor people. If it had got to the Don Evans level, yeah, we, we'd probably have a problem. 
but most of the people in the Commerce Department or most of the people in the State Department are career officials, uh, and a lot of them are very sensible people. And instead of just going ahead and, and exporting the software, uh, what we did is we wrote them a letter and asked for a formal legal opinion saying that under certain exceptions to the export rules, as long as we put some restrictions, but not perfect restrictions, some restrictions, and they actually helped us craft those restrictions in a very constructive way. Some restrictions on that software getting into a list of seven countries, including North Korea, Iran, Iraq, and like I said, it, you need to read it very carefully in terms of, of what this organization can do and what third parties can do with the software and things like that. Uh, but subject to those, those, uh, those details built into the distribution method, uh, we could use servers in the United States of America as a platform to broadcast this strong encryption software all over the world, including into China, uh, which I think is, is a tremendous win and a tre tremendous victory for uh, both the end users and for the organization that's trying to promote uh, human rights through the, um, through making available to people software that makes uh, anonymous communications possible. Um, so I, I guess the, the moral of that story is, uh, again, don't, don't always assume that the government is your enemy. If you talk to the right people and talk to them in the right way, uh, sometimes they will actively promote your goals too. Uh, you just have to be really careful about the means that you use to do it. Now, the, the next topic that we should get into, and I'm gonna do this really briefly, I'm sure that we'll have a lot of Q&A about this, uh, is the Hacktivismo Enhanced Source Software License, the HESLA. Uh, I know that that's been sort of controversial on uh, slash dot, and you know some people in the free software movement say that it's not the GPL. And well, if that's your criticism, I guess you're right. I concede it's it's not the GPL. Uh, what it does contain is some restrictions on conduct. Uh, if you use this software, what you do is you agree that you're not going to use it to violate people's human rights. You're not going to use it to cause uh, physical injury to people and, and some other restrictions on conduct that we don't think are entirely unreasonable. Um, the Free Software Foundation takes the position and they put something up on their website. Well, you can never put conduct restrictions in a, a software license. That's unenforceable. And their, their position is that uh, the law should be that you can't put conduct restrictions in software licenses. But the reality is, a lot of software companies do exactly that. So, so I, I'm not sure whether the, the Free Software Foundation actually gets to be the judge that determines that issue or whether that issue has actually been resolved. Um, additionally, I think there are some very significant advantages in the HESLA uh, over the GPL because we have explicit terms in there dealing with an issue that's very important in the human rights area, which is um, our government entities actually subject to it. Um, the, the GPL just simply doesn't deal with issues of sovereign immunity. And for my illustration, how many people here know what the 11th Amendment is? Do, do we have any hands at all? Does anybody know what the 11th Amendment is? Uh, well, let me ask you this. Can you sue the government of any state in federal court? Well, you, can't, you can in some cases if they're violating civil rights that are protected under the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. But if the federal law on which your case is based is based on the Commerce Clause as opposed to the 14th Amendment, the Commerce Clause being in the original Constitution, therefore it preceded the 11th Amendment, 14th Amendment came after the 11th Amendment. So if, if it's a Commerce Clause regulation, 
uh, you can't sue a state on that basis. So now they, they've thrown out certain kinds of anti-discrimination laws uh, to the extent that they're based only on the Commerce Clause and not the 14th Amendment. The, the reason that I asked the question, though, has to do with a, a 1999 case by the Supreme Court uh, called the, the, I think it's the College Savings Bank, and it was against the government of Florida. It's a trademark case, and they said that you can't sue the, the government of the state of Florida, even though Congress said we intend to make states subject to the trademark laws in the United States. The Supreme Court said you can't sue states for that unless the state says it can be sued. <laughs> so does that apply to copyrights? We don't know for sure yet, but let me ask you this. If, if the, uh, the state of Florida or the state of New York wanted to go ahead and start handing out free copies of Microsoft Windows and say, hey, you do whatever you want with it and you don't have to pay Microsoft a thing, could Microsoft sue the state of New York or the state of Florida for that? That's actually an open question right now. Um, and then when you get to the issue of foreign sovereigns, there are additional statutes that come into play. There is what's called a commercial activity exception to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Um, I think that uh, the licensing of software, even of free software, falls within that exception. Um, so when you're dealing with either a foreign government that decides for whatever reason that it's not afraid of our threat to sue them and actually uses that software and uses it for an improper purpose, or, and, and I'll get into some of the reasons why later, if I've got one minute re remaining, but um, when, you, when you deal with them or you deal with a multinational corporation, which we have difficulty suing right now in U.S. courts for human rights violations because even though they act in, in cahoots with you know, the government of Myanmar or you know, some of these African governments that, that engaged in terrible human rights violations, nevertheless, American oil companies seem to get off the hook for the human rights violations. Um, to, to the extent that this software license can somehow enter the mix, it may provide, and I'm not going to say it definitely does or definitely doesn't, but it will be tested in court someday eventually, and it may provide an additional avenue to get in and to do at least something to deter and to compensate human rights violations. Um, I think my time has expired, so let, let me sit down. I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions later, and thank you very much. Anyway, I'm going to start while they're just fixing the technology thing. Uh, I would like to first thank uh, my colleagues from Hacktivismo and the conference organizers for inviting us from human rights community to share our experiences and our needs and also present our wish list. Now, it's not that we have never been collaborating with the technology community. We have been communicating and also kind of an actively working with them to increase the collaboration and what Sharon suggested as building an alliance of consciences. Uh, some of us have actually actively volunteered to do the beta testing of the, some of the software they are developing. And we continue to do that, but as Sharon said, that we need more and more support and more and more kind of help from people who've been playing with technology. Now, my talk is going to mainly focus on placing the technology developments which people have tried and dreamt when the internet was just beginning to develop. And where has it led us after, let's say, seven to 10 years, when we have kind of seen now internet has becoming a, one of the mainstream media, at least in the developed countries. And slowly, countries like China are also catching up and become a very active user of the net. Uh, in the beginning, we, we keep on kind of repeating the, this kind of quotations, which is at least attributed to Gilmore, and uh, Gilmore has slightly 
change quotation to say on it, but it says that Nate treats censorship as a damage and doubts around it. And in 2004, when we see this country like China or Cuba or many other countries, we realize that the reality on the ground has changed quite differently. Or it had turned out to be much different than we thought it would be. But don't worry, many of us dreamt about it and I suppose it's not bad to dream that. Or at least try to dream a good things and then see how it, the ground reality works out and work from that and make sure that the next time when we do things, we will take into account more ground reality. Uh, we also thought that internet, uh, internet as a revolutionary medium, which will has in inherently empowering power, democratizing, and we thought authoritarian regime will crumble. And my colleague had very well explained that, in fact, in China or some other countries, the things have not really turned out to be what we thought it would be. Uh, also, some of the other presenters have kind of said in a more context of US and many other Western countries that there is no privacy left and let's get used to it. So which means that the more and more bad news are coming right at the home of the internet development. Anonymity could be broken the moment the software which can locate the geography or geography locator software become a more norm and the court starts recognizing that and start implementing that also in their judgment. And Many more and more countries try seeing that, oh, if China can build a great firewall, why not we can do it? And start repeating, or l start learning from the lessons of China. Then we are headed with a technology not working in our favor, or the way we thought it would work in our favor. And we are faced with technology as a big brother watching us everywhere, not just here. Now, and, but still, even after all this development, and possibility of technology being misused. Even the US government wanted to kind of fund a project called Global Internet Freedom Act. As far as I know, that never, the bill never got passed through the, either Congress or Senate. But the idea was to support actively the anti-censorship or let's say censorship circumvention software and help the users in the countries like China or Cuba or Korea and in North Korea and others to circumvent the censorship. Which means that even as long as 2003, people still think that the anti-censorship software are the need for helping the users in many of those repressive countries to get access to the information. Now, we'll come back to this issue later on to just in terms of seeing whether this kind of assumption makes much sense today or we need to see the technology within the more social context in terms of what we have begun to accept and how the censorship is kind of in a becoming more and more a mainstream thinking rather than just becoming an isolated fact somewhere happening and only in a repressive countries. Okay. Uh, in the beginning, like when the, uh, the government responses were kind of in a classified in a mainly in a two types of responses, which was one was more reactive response. Whenever they see something, they try to control it either through, this was in the beginning that the high access cost in a countries where the internet infrastructure or telecom infrastructure was owned by government. And they kept the internet prices so high that not many people would be able to access it. Many countries have kind of broken those barriers now because the market mechanism has forced them to rethink the access cost and it, that has no more kind of been effective for. But at the same time, the filtering content, minter, uh, monitoring it online behavior or prohibiting internet use entirely. This was one of the pattern of kind of a thinking which began when the internet began spreading in the various countries. Some of the other countries which were even little smarter than that, that instead of restricting alone, they thought that internet has a great potential for economic development and if you want to be in, integrated to the global economy and communication, let's let it come, but we'll control it. And China would be a, one of the, this kind of a shining example of that kind of pattern that they allowed it for the economic purpose and the, the internet usage skyrocketed from almost nothing in 1996 to 60 million users now. Next please. Uh, in the beginning, like the if 1996, I'm sure some of you 
have participated in the Internet Freedom Campaign, which was done by the Global Internet Liberty Campaign, was the Blue Ribbon Campaign against anti uh, internet censorships. And that was the campaign which started in the US. So let's not forget that the first major censorship articulation came in this country before the other countries were even trying to figure out what the heck this NATE is all about. We had started it all here. And at that time, the prime justification which began surfacing and for a very solid argumentation was to protect children from undeserved information or whatever other kinds of information they don't want to, them to see. Thought and fight terrorism, silence the racist and hate monger. Now, let's go fast forward to 2004. The list has expanded and it has become more universal. It's not that these arguments are any longer used only in one country, not only in democratic country or repressive country. More or less everybody is copying from each other and international laws are being kind of synchronized in terms of thinking and in terms of even creating a common legal framework around internet censorship or what you call it internet regulation. Okay. And this kind of access control is, as I said, it's not necessarily just limiting to the internet. Even some countries are even going beyond it, like China. They want to even control all digital form of communication, which includes even text messaging. Now, there's no guarantee that this will not happen in any other country, because everybody uses the argument that national security comes first above anything else. And national security becomes an issue in many countries quite often. So the China is experimenting how it works out, but other countries might follow it. Uh, this, then in a country like Zimbabwe or many other countries, actually, the mandatory monitoring of email communication. So it's, when we say internet censorship, it is no longer just a blocking of websites and other things. But all form of digital communications are being surveilled and being monitored, being logged, being put into a database, mining, everything is happening around that. Now then, the data retention laws are also becoming more and more universalized. In a sense, initially it began with one country, then they said, okay, let's have a uh, cross-Atlantic uh, regulation around it, or cross-Atlantic agreement on data retentions, and those laws are soon likely to become kind of in a more or less universally practiced laws. Um, also, it's no longer at the stage of legislation alone. As Sharon mentioned that China had already had like 64 people who are very explicitly prosecuted, convicted, and put behind bar on the charges which are directly related with their use of internet. So internet censorship is no longer a theoretical debate any longer. It's no longer legislating bad laws and let's see what happens, whether they will practice it. But it is becoming a part of the practice now. Uh, now, in, in a generalized pattern of surveillance is uh, increasing, the privacy is kind of in a being challenged all the time. The people are finding it hard and hard to really use internet in a way we thought in the beginning that we would be able to use it. The ISP and telecommunications are becoming a kind of a potential police state or, po or a po potential arm of the police because they are asked to perform certain tasks which in a traditional way were supposed to be a law enforcement task. Censorship is at some level in the form of either through self-censorship or filter on the public access point or voluntary pledges is becoming a privatized censorship. Now, all this is happening. It's not necessary that people have to wait for 2001 or 9-11 event has to happen. This has been a gradual growth of our thinking, which has been kind of modified to accept that we need all this thing to secure ourselves. And that thinking is kind of getting accepted and legislative process are being kind of going without being challenged. And in uh, this one, I'll recover. Next one. Uh, uh, in a global way, now we have one more argument to justify all this kind of, a, let's say, restriction on the free expression on the net, as well as even in an other form of practicing a civil liberty, is terrorism. And terrorism is, is used to justify repression and restriction on all types of free expression. Same way governments are kind of in a, trying to get immunity from their criticism 
on their practices in the name of kind of, a, let's say, protecting us from against the terrorism or protecting the national security. In that environment, the, the impact on the global human rights is going to be very serious. And we have already begun when the debate around Abu Ghraib happened. In this country also, people began saying, maybe we don't need international laws. Maybe torture is essential. And if that starts happening, which means that we began with a one dream 10 years ago when we thought internet is a liberating kind of a medium and it will allow us a global community, freedom, and all kinds of benefits. And today, in a change environment, people here also begin thinking, now if this could happen in the birthplace of internet, I'm not sure how much the global community around the globe can expect their own government, which has a very weak, let's say, history of democratic practices or even civil liberties, can expect to protect the rights of the user. Now, it, it's in that sense, we would suggest that maybe in a future, when we think about any medium or when we think about any technology which can have an impact on a society, at that time, we might want to put and place those technological development or our own role within the larger context of censorship, freedom, and human rights. In that situation, we have a better chance to understand and maybe have a modest dream about what this technology can really do it. Thank you very much. How's everybody doing out there? Okay. I just want to thank the Cult of the Dead Cow for having this panel. I want to thank Oxblood in particular for inviting me. And I want to thank Grandmaster Rat for letting me crash on his couch last night. <clears throat> um, basically, I'm going to be talking about the Citizen Lab, which is a lab at the University of Toronto that was founded by Professor Ron Debert, uh, who's a professor of political science at University of Toronto. Um, basically, uh, the Citizen Lab has been great for me. Let me uh, take a lot of the projects I was working on out of my basement and move them into a university setting, which is pretty good in terms of bandwidth and equipment and all that kind of fun stuff. <laughs> basically, my job is to go through the computer science department, find the best hackers that I can find, and also pillage hackers from the Toronto 2600, is representing right here. <clears throat> and basically, we put them together with activists and uh, people in political science to work on uh, projects relating to internet policy and politics. And what we want to do, I mean, what we do do is create a, a space and an environment um, where we encourage people to get under the hood, look at what's going on, and basically provide a hardcore technical background to a lot of the human rights projects that other people are working on. Um, you know, we want to get people that really understand the technology and the policy and put them together and see what they come up with. Um, yeah. Um, basically, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Uh, one of the projects that, that I'm heavily involved with is called the Open Ed Initiative, and actually it's grown out of uh, a basement operation into a collaboration between three universities, and we managed to secure funding from the Open Society Institute. Um, basically, we're looking at internet filtering uh, and surveillance practices worldwide uh, from a technical and policy point of view, as well as looking at uh, the circumvention technology that others are developing and developing our own. Um, we're interested in a lot of questions relating to internet filtering, not just what's blocked and how, but who's making the decisions and how are those decisions made. Um, what involvement does the public have in those decisions and what do they know about it? And some of the projects, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about some of the projects that we're working on. Um, one of them is to put together a sort of Friendster slash Orcut of internet filtering in these countries. So, you know, who are the heads of the ISPs? Who are the people in government that make the decisions regarding the internet and regarding internet filtering? And kind of do a social network map and see in a lot of countries these people are related to each other or they have some kind of connection with one another. And we want to map kind of how the decisions are being made at a policy level as well as we want to map how this is being implemented on a technical level. Um, to do this, we, we have established a, a human-based network um, what we call H2H, hacktivist to hacktivist relationships with groups that are working on these issues 
in the countries. And this is extremely important. We also have a technological network um, so that we can do the testing of internet filtering worldwide. Um, I just want to talk about the human-based network because that gets overlooked a lot of times because you can find things technologically, but it's the context that's really important um, when you're dealing with internet censorship. Um, you know, a lot of countries block porn and other kinds of things. Yeah, if you look at my logs from the testing box we have at University of Toronto, they've emailed me a few times because uh, visiting hundreds of thousands of porn sites kind of sets off some red flags with the university. <clears throat> But uh, basically, these people provide the context and the technological research that we develop also enables them to challenge these practices in their countries on their own terms. Um, basically, what we do from a technological point of view is uh, we get access in these countries in a variety of ways, depending on the security situation in those countries and how much risk the individuals in those countries are willing to take. Um, because they are putting themselves at risk. For us, it's research, but for them, it's a serious concern. Um, what we do is we develop lists of URLs uh, and domains, um, some of which we call a global list, which is kind of a, just a broad category of URLs that we test to get a general sense of what's going on, as well as putting together a list of high-impact websites. And these are websites that are of particular concern in the country that we're testing. And what we do is we, we run through these uh, a number of times. The uh, first time is just a basically a get request, can, you know, can we get it or can we not? We record the headers and uh, send that information back to the lab for analysis. And anything that doesn't kind of match up, because we test one connection from our testing location in University of Toronto and another connection from the remote computer. And if the headers don't match or if something's weird going on, we flag that as kind of being odd. Because um, there's a lot of different behaviors in terms of filtering, um, depending on the type of filtering uh, that's going on. If they're filtering with a commercial application or something that gives you a block page, that's actually good for us because it tells you, you can't go here because we've blocked it. In other situations, you just get different headers. Um, we might, we'll get a 200 and they might get a 403 or a 404 or whatever. And in other cases, you don't get anything at all. The connection just dies when you try to go to a banned site. You don't get any headers back, you don't get anything. Um, that's sort of how we classify uh, the URLs that we test. And then the second run, after we've determined that something weird is going on, then we test with TCP traceroute and see how far up the chain we can go before it dies. Um, yeah, just a little bit about filtering. Blacklist means, you know, there's a, a list of URLs, categorized URLs usually, um, that are used to block. Whitelist means you only allow access to a certain number of URLs, and this has been called the national intranet model, which is uh, being developed in Myanmar, formerly Burma, and Cuba, which is basically they have an internal network for the citizens with pre-approved sites that they can visit. Um, content analysis is, you know, just mainly refers to um, blocking by keyword. Oh, the general network setup this is what I'm going to get into more specifically. As opposed to China, a lot of the countries that we're particularly focusing on right now are in Central Asia and the Middle East. And basically, we're seeing a kind of same setup developing. As opposed to China, which is basically router-based blocking, <clears throat> these countries are purchasing technology um, from Western companies and using that in conjunction with cache servers to actually have a really efficient uh, filtering system. Yeah, basically, this is the behavior of block pages. Um, one of the things we do is try to figure out exactly what technology they're using. And sometimes it's easy, like when they have smart filter in the block page. And usually, smart filter shows up in the headers as well. But other times, you know, they don't tell you exactly uh, what's going on in the headers. You just usually get a result back from net cache, which is, you know, just your basic caching server. Other times, you'll get just a generic error, and you don't really know what's going on. Basically. There's different levels of accountability. In some cases, it's good to have a block page because then you know for sure that it's being blocked by policy. Um, in Uzbekistan, they're actually uh, pretty interesting. Instead of giving you a block page or a timeout, they actually redirect you to another site. Um, so here we have Birlik, which is an opposition party, and Stop Dictator Karamov. Karamov is the president. And these redirect to weird, uh, MSN search and uh, some weird Russian site. And there's been reports from users there that what they'll actually do sometimes is make a fake website of the opposition party. And then when you sign up for their email list and other things, well, they all have it. So that's kind of sneaky. 
<clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about Saudi Arabia. Um, there's been a lot of work done on filtering there, and, and I've been working on it myself. Um, and it's a good kind of profile to counterbalance what's going on in China. Um, basically, they have a very centralized system. They have a, a big farm of uh, cache servers and proxy servers located at the ISU, which is way up on the chain. So all of the ISPs and universities and everything else that's underneath that are all subjected to blocking at this one centralized point. Um, so it's pretty easy to test and get a good sense of what's going on there. Um, they have block page filtering, uh, which is a uh, page comes up, tells you, hey, you can't go here because we've blocked it. And they have a uh, blocking request form and an unblock request form. I filled out the unblock request form a few times, but nothing happened. <clears throat> One of the things that we're working on, we we'll call it a fingerprint, but it's not really a fingerprint, is basically we want to figure out what com when commercial technology is being used in these countries to filter on a national level, we want to figure out what it is. And one of the ways that we've come up with is, uh, can you flick the next slide? Is to look for miscategorized URLs. Here's an example. Teenpregnancy.org is classified in smart filter as health and some other categories, which is generally OK, which means that you can get to it if those categories aren't being blocked. By the way, smart filter and WebSense have a filtering category called NGO slash advocacy groups which is basically um, you know, a handy category for regimes that might want to filter these groups. They just check it off on the box and go about their business. Um, but you'll notice that teenpregnancy.org slash teen is misclassified as pornography. There's nothing pornographic there. It's an error probably because um, of teen in the, do the domain and teen in the past kind of sets off their automated process. They claim to manually look at all the URLs in their database, but they don't. Um, so basically, what I do is I put together lists of these misclassified URLs and I run them and for different commercial products. And if I'm getting a good high hit rate on blocks for sites that shouldn't be blocked, it tips me off pretty well as to what uh, commercial filtering system they're using. And actually, in Saudi Arabia, if you look, if you look in, the, in the content of the, of the block page, you'll see they insert this special tag. And when it's a smart filter block, they have filter equals SF, and when it's a block that they've added themselves, like Arab Times, which is not in the smart filter database, it says local. So it's easy to tell what ones they've added and what ones are blocked default by smart filter. Uh, recently, Reporters Without Borders put out an advisory about some gay websites that were being blocked in Saudi Arabia, and they were blocked because I checked. But the thing is, they weren't blocked because the Saudis wanted to block them. They were blocked because they were miscategorized by smart filter. So a lot of these... Uh, countries that are using this commercial applications to do their filtering, I mean, really it's a problem of having proprietary lists that people can't check. And so people are, are subjecting entire nations to filtering based on the decisions made by a company uh, on information that they won't let us scrutinize. Um, there's also other unintended consequences. This happened in India. They, re they tried to block one Yahoo group, and they sent out an order to all the ISPs to block it. Some of them did, and some of them didn't. But most of them didn't have the capacity to filter, so they just blocked the IP address of groups.yahoo.com. So all of the Yahoo groups were blocked until they finally figured out how to block just the one. Well, some of the ISPs, anyways. Um, the other thing is recently hindounity.org uh, received the same treatment, but there's a bunch of other sites hosted on that server that are also blocked. And in terms of countries where filtering is done within a sort of legal environment, this is good ammunition for people that are fighting because there's no order to block those sites, yet they're blocked. And so they can take that to court and challenge the governments uh, in an open way. Moving on to circumvention technology, uh, one of the things we're working on is called Siphon. Um, it started kind of off as a side project, and I haven't had a lot of time to work on it. But basically, it's nothing new, and it's really simple. All I wanted to do was make a really simple application that, pe that non-technical people could use that was really similar to existing products that were out there, except for with just ease of use as its main priority, and taking into account some of the vulnerabilities that people had talked about at those existing products. The main one I pillaged was CGI proxy, which is really awesome, and a lot of people use it. But for non-technical people setting up Apache and Mod SSL, it just they won't do it. And it needs to be made really easy for them. So we actually coded it in Python. Basically, it's an SSL web server um, and uh, provides the user with a web form. They put in the URL they want to go to. It, it rewrites the, 
the uh, URLs to point back through the proxy and delivers it to the user. It's, uh, we use Pi to EXE for Windows to make it nice, so they just double click on it and it starts up. And it's, uh, we try to keep the options pretty limited. We have bandwidth throttling so that if you don't want your, use up all your bandwidth letting people surf through your connection, um, you can, and user management. But the main thing that we wanted to do is sort of replace the idea of a technological peer-to-peer -peer network with a human peer-to-peer -peer network. So the problem with peer-to-peer -peer networks and circumvention is that if you use a system that relies um, on nodes knowing other nodes, if they can node harvest, so connect each, make a new account and connect into the network and get an IP each time, they just start adding that to the blocking list. The same is true for, for distributing you know, URLs to, publicly, to uh, public proxies and things like that, is that if the people you're targeting with the information can find out about it, so can the people intercepting and looking at that information or monitoring these groups. And so what we wanted to do is, was make the requirement basically that you have to know somebody outside of the country to run this thing for you. It's not a service, we don't, it's not a public service that you would let people, it's just for people that you know. And we thought if we keep it really simple and kind of low tech like that, that it has a better chance of survival. And along with the people that are working on uh, public proxy systems and all that kind of thing, we just th thought it was a good addition. Because the other problem with, with uh, volunteer-based systems or public proxy systems, I mean, this is the case with CGI proxy for sure, is that if you have somebody running a uh, CGI proxy and telling users, hey, you know, use this, they can intercept everything that you're doing too. So the other problem with it is uh, self-signed certificates. Um, those can easily be subjected to man-in-the-middle attacks, and people were pretty concerned about that. The other thing we wanted to do is, is uh, start a resource where basically we would collect projects that other people were working on and look at uh, certain scenarios where they would be effective so that if there were groups or individuals that wanted to implement these products, they could look at it and say, yeah, you know, my scenario fits this situation. This product is what's the best for me. Um, and also, you know, look at if there was any particular problems or glaring errors in the design of the system, kind of point those out. Uh, so we did that with um, uh, IBB, which uh, also runs Voice of America. They contracted with Anonymizer to provide uh, web-based circumvention systems to people in Iran. And it works. But the problem is that the system designed to get around filtering filters. Because if any of you run public proxies or CGI proxy, most people are looking at porn. And so they set up this system to block access to porn, except for it was done in, in a really horrible way. Basically, it was done by blocking keywords and domains. So if the domain name, not the path, just the domain, contained any of the keywords, you couldn't go there. So you couldn't go to georgewbush.com, because it's got Bush in it. And you couldn't go to a lot of US embassy sites, because it has ass in it. You couldn't go to any site that was .tv, because it has TV in it, a whole domain name. And the same with MY for Malaysia. I mean, it was a completely ridiculous system. We found, I think, 82 of these words, and we tested them, and we tested them from connections in Iran, too, to try to find sites that were double blocked, so sites that were blocked by the Iranians and sites that were blocked by the, by the system that they're supposed to use to get to these sites. We didn't find many, but we found a few. Um, the other thing is that when you, when you, when you go to these anonymizer sites and you translate the Farsi, it tells them that, that their anonymity is protected, that they're not at risk from hack, hackers or governments that might want to spy on them, but it's all in plain text. <laughs> so they're giving people this false sense of security when their communications can easily be intercepted. Yeah, they can circumvent properly, and yeah, the URL that they want to go to is obfuscated, but the content can easily be sniffed. Um, so basically, Anonymizer has uh, an SSL option uh, for premium users. I guess that's not good enough for the Iranian people. So the main thing I kind of wanted to end with, which, which is uh, Oxblood's idea of hacktivist to hacktivist networks, and that it really takes uh, developing relations of trust with real people and not just relying on technological solutions to these problems. Um, you know, user, users are being encouraged by people, a lot of times these sort of third-party brokers that, that tour around and visit with different NGOs and recommend software to them. So, 
you know, there needs to be uh, a pretty good audit of what's available out there so that groups can make informed decisions uh, for, you know, for security needs that fit their specific purposes. Because in, 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 there's different climates in terms of security in different countries. So, so some solutions that might not be completely fully secure um, might work in a situation where the consequences, you know, aren't too bad. Um, and that's, that's something that, that we have to do working really closely with these groups, especially in terms of development. It's not enough to just develop some new cool technology or whatever the latest thing is, because in a lot of the cases, I visited NGOs where they got 15 users sharing one 56K dial-up. I mean, they just can't, the bandwidth restrictions are huge in, in a lot of developing countries, and also really ancient operating systems, and, a, and pretty much everybody's running Windows. People are slowly migrating to Linux, but, um, you know, Windows is sort of what, what everybody runs. Uh, I guess I'm running out of time here. I have a couple of sort of suggestions that, that people have told me in terms of types of technology that they'd like to see um, be implemented um, in addition to knowledge transfer and training and things like that. Is one requirements that projects sort of have a firm commitment to support because groups, a lot of times people will go over there, install stuff, teach them how to use it, but then there's no support over time. The other thing is things like uh, remote backup systems that are really easy to run because um, now that groups are becoming part of the WTO and as part of that they have to crack down on piracy, they use that as an excuse to go and seize uh, computers of NGOs because most people aren't, aren't using legitimate versions of Windows. Oh my God. And so they use that as an, as an excuse to, to seize their boxes and so at the very least they'd, they'd like to have their data stored somewhere else so they can at least recover from it. Um, I don't know, a lot of really simple ideas like that, the main point is to put a really user-friendly you know, interface on them so that people don't have to be too inconvenienced because if, if it's too much inconvenience to use security, a lot of times they just won't. So that's my sort of thing that I like to get across to everybody is that it's more than just development. We actually have to start developing these human relationships with people. Thanks. I'd like to thank two groups of people, uh, our panelists, and uh, especially you guys. This is a long presentation. You're all very hardy. Thanks for sticking around. I just want to check how much time we have, about five minutes? Five minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a shorter Q&A than we would like, but uh, I'm sure some people have questions. Microphone is up here. Hi. Uh, one figure that stuck with me during uh, particularly your presentation was the 200,000 people uh, forced into labor without uh, any kind of trial or anything like that. Is that indicative of latent revolution bubbling up to the surface, or is that more you get the feeling of abuse by local officials, of somebody torqued off the local magistrate and got themselves tossed for that? Do I need this? Is this on? Is this on? Yeah. Um, there, there, are, there are a range of different reasons why people are put into uh, re-education re through labor. Um, they could be dissidents because they need to be re-educated. Um, they could be people who have pissed off locals, all of the above. Uh, one of the things that's a problem with our trying to um, investigate that is it's very hard to get information. And that underscores why it's very hard for us to do the work. But what we also see is that there is a percentage of those that are treated particularly harshly and that's, quote, political related crime. So if you're you know, an organizer of an independent democratic party, um, you know, those people are going to get treated much more harshly. And then I think recently, that not only in the RTL camps, um, they've also been put into psychiatric hospitals and Kong, where they're really subject to really, you know, really torture and very bad things because there's something wrong, they think, with them, and they're trying to just sort of wash their brain. Yeah. I had a question about the... The Great Firewall of China, their the current attempts to bypass that, do you think there's a certain amount of, like obviously the, the more that it's attempted to bypass, and the, if it actually works, then the Chinese will update it so that it stops working, assumedly. Um, is there a certain amount of time that you think that it would have to be essentially useless for them to just take it down, or would there just have to be massive pol political change in the country before that would be taken down? 
I, I'm going to also ask Bill Shaw to weigh in on this, but I think our, from our perspective, from the, the activist perspective, I think there's been a shift, and the shift has been where we, although you're using, and we're still using the word, the Great Firewall, I think the shift in strategy within China is from blocking the strategy to filtration and monitoring and surveillance. And that's, you can see that trend in the new SNM, the software, that's now filtering S, you know, M, SMS messages like 100 million a year. And they actually can store the sender and everything. So I think the shift has been to not just stop, but to actually let people know that it's being monitored for content. And I think that has a real ripple effect. So I think that's even more effective to not just stop, but to let people know what you send and what you received is being monitored, which is much more uh, effective. Um, I've, I've found this just uh, fascinating, and I really appreciate um, all the speakers. I just had a question uh, more on, let's say, spam, which I think a lot of people do want to eliminate from their lives, but from what I'm hearing here, to do that is going to have a significant impact because you have to eliminate the anonymity, <laughs> the anonymity of, of the sender, and that's to eliminate the spam is my understanding. So I guess I would just like some of these thoughts on how do we accomplish both goals to, to, to eliminate the spam but still try to keep things open for things like these human rights. I mean, some of the testing that I've was been doing with email accounts in China, basically spam filters at some of the uh, email providers there are configured to block political messages. So spam filtering technology is being used right. for that purpose. Um, but in terms of, of just blocking spam in general, I mean, most sysadmins set up, you know, spam assassin or whatever. I mean, I, I don't really see how that affects things at a, at a national at a national level uh, I, would, I would like to just add that this uh, dealing with this kind of issues maybe like when it comes to censorship why do we always go to the level of let's say block it and we are willing to give away our rights because there is some annoyance coming from the marketers. Why not we use the same mechanism which has encouraged because the spam has a very strong connection with the way the marketing concept have developed. So instead of dealing with that to a level of like, the first thing we do is sacrifice our civil liberty because we are annoyed. Instead of going to a, a solution, it's like market-based solution is being promoted all through in terms of getting all targeted marketing and everything. So if we apply that principle to deal with the spam, that if, if it is being discouraged so much, the consumers stop buying on anything which has come by spam, and the way we have encouraged and allowed even the direct marketing to continue to go on challenge, it has got extended into electronic form in terms of a spam. I think that may be a better way to even start thinking about it rather than just letting our anonymity go because we want to deal with the spam. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm sure a few people might have some more questions. I think these guys maybe have a few minutes uh, outside or wherever, and thanks very much for coming. Coming up next, we have...